Chapter 5, Open Sacks Physics, Chapter Summary. Okay, Chapter 5 is all about more forces. We're going to look at some other forces, but I think it's a good time to take a little pause and look back at where we've come. Just as a quick review, what have we done so far? Okay, I made a little notation up here. So this first is velocity, is the x component of the velocity plus the y component of the velocity. This is the idea that we need vectors, right? We need to know how to find the components of vectors. We need to know how to add, subtract, find the magnitude. We know how to deal with those by breaking them into components, vectors. This is a review. That's, this is a review of a review. Okay, so if you need to go back and look at that video, that's fine. Next, we have the definition of average velocity. I've written it as one dimension, but we could write it as a vector. But the velocity, the average velocity is the change in position with respect to time. I do not want to see distance over time. Do not write distance over time. Please don't write that. A little part of me inside dies when I see velocity as distance over time. Just don't do it. Please, I'm asking you, don't do that. Okay. It's the rate of change of position with respect to time. We can also write the average velocity as the final velocity plus the initial velocity over two. And I'm using the notation from the book where the final velocity is just V, the initial velocity is V zero. Okay. That's not always true. We'll see a case where that's not true later today. Next, we have the definition of acceleration, the rate of change of velocity. Again, not V over T, not. It's not. And this is the scalar version. From these two alone, we can derive these kinematic equations. So this is x as a function of time with initial velocity and the, and the acceleration. This is the velocity as a function of time. And then this is a special version that does not have time in it. And we'll actually see where that comes from when we get to work energy. We can rederive that. That's kinematics. And in 2D, if the normal forces, just gravity, we have projectile motion, then we have horizontal motion, vertical motion, and those are independent of each other. Okay. Now we are over here to Newton's second law, which tells us that the net force on an object changes its motion. And that goes back over here, right? Change in velocity. Change is so important. Change. Uh, and then really, really only looked at a couple of, of forces before. We have the gravitational force, mass times g, where g is the gravitational field, uh, negative 9.8 in the y direction. And then we had these other two forces, tension and the normal force. Those were forces of constraint. We don't know what they are. They just are what they are to make things be what they want to be. Okay. The tension is the, the string, the force the string pulls in the direction of the string to keep the string the same length and the normal forces between a uh, contact between surfaces. Okay. Let's move on to the, the forces that I want to look at. Friction, drag force, spring force, and then there's some other stuff in there that I'm just going to mention, but I'm not really going to focus on. Let's consider Friction. We, we kind of use friction, but it was always just, here it is. Okay. So, I have a demo. Here's a surface, and there's a block. Now, what if I push on this block with one Newton? I'm pushing with one Newton, and it doesn't move. Well, then, if it doesn't move and it stays at rest, the net force has to be zero. Uh, so, I could write that as a free body diagram. Let's do that. So, here's my free body diagram. Well, I'm going to draw a box too. You know, you could just draw the dot. There's my box. I know that I have a contact for, I have a long range force of gravity. I'll write that as mg. I know there's a contact force. The normal force pushes up. And I could actually calculate the value of that normal force. In this case, the magnitude would be equal to the weight because, it's not always true, but because the block doesn't accelerate in the y direction, and those are the two forces in the y direction. It has to be. And then I said I push with a force. F equals 1 x hat newton. I'm going to put it in the x direction. And it doesn't move. There has to be a backwards pushing force at friction. The magnitude of the friction force would be 1 newton. Okay. Now, I'm going to push with 2 newtons. I'm pushing with 2 newtons. Can you see? That's 2 newtons. 2 newtons I'm pushing. It still doesn't move. If it still doesn't move with 2 newtons, sorry, then if I increase this to 2, 
and it doesn't accelerate, then that has to increase to 2. It has to. Okay. And it turns out that the friction force is a force of constraint. And we're going to call this static friction. And static means not move, but it actually means not slide. The two surfaces are not sliding relative to each other. If I push hard enough, let's say I push with 20 newtons, it actually is going to start sliding. Okay, so there's a maximum value to that static friction force, and we can calculate it as the following. Friction, I'll call it F S F S for static friction force, friction static. I can't remember how the book wrote it. Less than or equal to mu, the Greek letter mu, S times N. So this is the magnitude of the static friction force. This is what we call the coefficient of static friction. Why am I writing this out? I just, I kind of like this chart, that's why. And then that is the magnitude of the normal force. Notice that this is not a vector equation because the friction force is this way, the normal force is that way. I couldn't put a vector vector because they're not in the same direction. But this tells us not what the friction force is, this tells us the maximum friction force, right? The friction force can be whatever it needs to be, but the maximum is gonna be this coefficient, which has no units, times the normal force. The normal force, not the weight. Okay. Um, so this depends on the two types of surfaces interacting. So rubber on asphalt, or steel on wood, or uh, felt on fiberglass, anything. You, those two materials are experimentally determined, the coefficient of friction, mu. That is, that's how we write it, mu, but that's a Greek letter mu. It's not a u, it's a mu, okay? Less than or equal to. That's static friction. Notice that if I push down on the block, then I'm gonna increase the normal force, which would increase the maximum friction force. Okay, now imagine that I take the block, I push it, and it starts to slide. It's no longer static friction. It's now kinetic friction. And we have another model for the kinetic friction, and it looks like this. F, F, K for kinetic equal mu K, N. So for once the thing starts to slide, there is a constant magnitude friction force that depends on the coefficient of friction, kinetic friction, and the normal force. But it's a constant value. Okay. And again, this is the normal force, not the weight. Typically, but not always, the coefficient of kinetic friction is lower than those. But those two depend on the two types of surfaces interacting. And there's a whole bunch of awesome problems that we can do with these, but uh, we will look at that in problems. So that's, I'm giving a summary, right? It's a summary. I'm not doing everything. And we will do that. Okay, so that's the first special force, friction. It's special because we have to define it with this model that doesn't even give us the direction, right? Because we have to look at the surface and say it's in the direction. Um, this direction of this force is parallel to the surface and in a way to prevent things from sliding, which doesn't tell you the direction all the way every time. And this is in the opposite direction of the relative motion. And I say that relative because you can get problems like with a truck that's speeding that way, but the block's sliding back this way, and the friction's actually pushing forward. So, okay. friction, super important. Yeah. And it gets way more complicated. This is just a model. This is a great opportunity to talk about the nature of science. We try to model the interaction between these two surfaces, which are really think of these atoms interacting, and it's super complicated. And this is a model that works very well, but not all the time. We can find things that break this model. If you push things together super, 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 super hard, we no longer have this relationship. It kind of maxes out. Um, and so there's a lot of situations like that. Okay. But typically, both of these coefficients typically are less than one. And that would be useful, but we'd have to look up those coefficients. Okay. Next special force. And this one's pretty awesome. Okay, so we've looked at something like this before. 
here's a ball, I'm going to drop it, and it's going to have a gravitational force pulling on the ball, mg, and so f net y is going to be negative mg equals ma, so the acceleration at ay in the y direction is negative g. Okay, we did that. Okay. Ball down. But what about this? I have an object here. It's a coffee filter. Let's take this coffee filter and drop it. Well, that didn't accelerate at g. Just as a comparison, drop these two together. I mean, that coffee filter is moving down at a, at a at mostly a constant speed the whole time down. If it's moving at a constant speed, it, there has to be some other force acting on it. Let's delete this. Delete. The deleter. It's, it's an eraser. Here's my coffee filter. I know I have a downward gravitational force. Even though it's small compared to that, there's still one there. And if it's moving at a constant speed, there has to be an upward pushing force, and we call that the drag force, or you could call it air resistance. This is a really awesome force, but it's not new. You've already experienced this. If you're driving in a car and you put your hand out the window, you can feel the air pushing against your hand. That's that drag force. And that force depends on a couple of things. It depends on the speed how fast you're going, right? As you increase speed, that force increases. It depends on the surface area. If you have your hand like this, um, if you put a bigger hand there, you'd feel greater force. It depends on the shape of your hand. So if you have your hand like this with a cone in front of it, it's gonna have a less drag than if it's just flat. And finally, it depends on the density of air. or whatever is in there. Okay, so we know speed, that's our variable V. The area is A. The shape is something we call the drag coefficient C. And then the density of air, we're gonna use the Greek letter rho, not, not P, that's rho. And so with all that together, F drag is one half rho A C V squared. This is what we're gonna use for the drag force. It's kind of a big deal, right? because this is a non-constant force. Notice that as the velocity increases, the force increases, but the velocity depends on the force. So you have this like circular problem right here that would make things very difficult to uh, work with. We will indeed work with them anyway. There is a trick I'm gonna show you in a separate video because it's not in the book. I'm gonna show you how to deal with that. So we can model the motion of a, a filter like this. It starts off at rest, so there's no air resistance, but as it speeds up, the air resistance increases until it gets to this point right here where the two are constant and we have constant speed. We call that terminal velocity. So if you were able to plot the velocity as a function of time, it would look like this velocity, the magnitude. It would start off at rest, it would increase, and then reach some constant value, and we call that a VT, terminal velocity. Terminal because it doesn't go any faster. It's the end right of speeding up. Now we can calculate terminal velocity, right? If I have a fallen coffee filter and suppose I know uh, I can calculate the area, I can calculate the area, you can look up the drag coefficient. It depends on the shape. The density of air at, at the ground level is about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. And so you can find that. So we could find that drag force. And if those two values are equal, I can say 1 half rho a c v squared minus mg equals 0. That's the net force in the y direction. I can solve for v. I get v equals the square root of 2 mg over rho a c. And that's the terminal velocity. And we're gonna, I'll do a problem with that because there's a whole bunch of fun stuff that you can do with that. And I'm going to model it for this part right here, which is really difficult because it's not constant acceleration. It's not constant speed. It's just difficult. Now, there is another uh, 
another kind of drag force. Uh, it turns out that for, suppose you take a little marble and you drop it in oil and it's moving through the oil very slowly in a much more viscous situation, then this is just a model. There's places where this doesn't work. When you go on like near the speed of sound and other situations, it doesn't work. Again, back to the nature of science. So if we have a viscous or very, very tiny object, maybe it's a something super small, then we use what's called Stokes' Law. And this calculates the drag force as, uh, is it six? Yeah, six pi r eta v. So six is the number six, pi is pi. This is the radius of the object in meters. This is the viscosity. This is eta, the viscosity of the fluid. Viscosity. And this is the velocity. So you'll notice in this case, for these uh, viscous situations, the drag force is only proportional to the velocity, where here's proportional to the velocity squared. I'm not going to give you any problems like that, but we'll do some things like this just because there's a bunch of awesome stuff. I would definitely expect you to be able to deal with terminal velocity. Um, that's not too terribly difficult. Okay. One last thing, and then I'll mention the other things. And we talked about this before. Elastic objects. These are also super useful and, and very complicated in a special way. So here is a spring. And let me put a 50 gram mass on there. And notice what happens that I can't connect the spring. There it goes. So the spring stretched. So the spring stretched some amount. And at this point, there are two forces on this mass. There's the downward gravitational force and the upwards pushing spring force. Now let's double the mass. So we double the force pulling down. This is 100 grams. And if you measure the stretch, it's stretched twice as much. So the upwards pulling force from the spring is proportional to how far it's stretched. So we call this Hooke's Law. And it says the force due to the spring is K delta L. So this is the force. K is what we call the spring constant. in newtons per meter, and delta L is the stretch or compression. You gotta put the R in there, stretch or compression, okay? So some springs you can compress them. This one is a stretch only, you, it, this is the way it's made, you can't compress it, but you could compress that. And so a typical spring like this uh, may have a spring constant on the order of 10 newtons per meter, uh, your car, the shocks in your car, could have a spring constant on the order of a thousand newtons per meter. So if you stretched it uh, one meter, you would have a thousand newton force. If you stretch this one one meter, if, if it didn't break, you'd get 10 newton force. So it tells you the relationship between how far you stretch it and the force. These are also super, 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 super important. However, they're also super complicated because uh, the problem is that it's not constant. If I change, as I pull it down, the force changes. So I can get these weird motions, which I will show you how to model, and it's super awesome in a separate video, not covered by the book, bonus material. Okay, so I do want to mention the other uh, thing in here, and I'm not gonna even write down the form of this, but I will tell you, they're, they're really cool, but they're more engineering related, and I just think that we have better things to do with air drag and the spring stuff. That's what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, so the first is what's called young modulus. So imagine that I have a cylinder like this and I stretch it and it stretches a tiny little bit. Well, the amount it stretches depends on the type of material it is. My video is getting slow. I'm just gonna end this because I don't really care about it anyway and I don't want the video to get messed up. And I will talk to you later. Thumbs up, it gets There we go. Okay, the end.